In this video, we'll look at the entire scope of care associated with an amputation, from preoperative care through surgery and concluding with postoperative care. These three phases of surgery are referred to as perioperative. Here is UCSF Medical Center's Dr. Lisa Pascal discussing perioperative care for amputee patients in more detail. Undergoing an amputation can be an overwhelming and life-changing event. In addition to the surgeons and nurses that may be involved in your care, there are many rehabilitation specialists who will be working with you to help you in your recovery and to maximize your ability to participate in many of the activities that you performed prior to your surgery. There are many different rehabilitation specialists that you may be working with. In general, a physical therapist will help you to work on what we call mobility, which can mean basic activities such as moving around in bed to more advanced activities such as ambulation, which can range from walking using parallel bars in a rehabilitation gym to walking in the community. You may also work with an occupational therapist who will focus on your ability to perform self-care skills such as grooming, dressing, bathing, and toileting. Often, while in the hospital, many patients now have the opportunity to see a physician who specializes in rehabilitation. These physicians, known as physical medicine and rehabilitation specialists, or physiatrists, may provide your team with recommendations that can optimize your functional recovery. In many settings, the physiatrists help to determine the degree of rehabilitation care that you may need upon discharge from the hospital. Ideally, working with rehabilitation specialists should begin prior to amputation. But in many cases, if you are like most patients, you will begin work with these specialists shortly after surgery with the goal of improving your ability to mobilize or move around and in and out of bed as soon as possible. Depending on the type of surgery that you have, goals might include using a walker or wheelchair. By mobilizing soon after surgery, you will be able to prevent complications, such as the formation of blood clots in your legs or lungs, pneumonia, damage to your skin from being in bed too long, and significant loss of endurance. Therapists will be teaching you how to do many mobility and self-care activities safely, and they will be able to teach your friends or family if needed so that they can help you after you leave the hospital. It is important to participate as much as possible during these sessions your ability to progress in therapy will determine your ongoing need for therapy and your potential for being a successful user of a prosthesis. A physiatrist may assist your team to determine the type of rehabilitation setting that might be best for you after leaving the hospital. For many patients, returning home is ideal, especially if they are adapting well to mobilizing and performing self-care activities, like dressing and bathing without difficulty. In these cases, patients may receive their therapy services as an outpatient. For other patients who may be having more difficulty with mobility or self-care activities, a short stay in a skilled nursing or rehabilitation facility may be appropriate. The goal of admission to either of these facilities is to continue to help a patient perform these skills well so that he or she can return home safely. After returning home, further occupational or physical therapy might be prescribed. From the time of surgery, and sometimes even before surgery, the rehabilitation team will closely monitor your progress. Your progress helps to determine the potential for you to use a prosthesis. In addition to your progress in therapy, there are other factors that are considered when determining your ability to use a prosthesis successfully. A few of them include your activity level prior to surgery, other health issues that might affect your endurance, the condition and function of your residual limb and sound limb, and your own personal goals. If you are a candidate for a prosthesis, you will also be seen by your prosthetist who will continue to work with you as your prosthesis is made. Even after you receive your prosthesis, your prosthetist will be a valuable resource should you require any further prosthetic adjustments or equipment. It will also be important for you to keep your follow-up appointments with your other care providers. This might include the physiatrist and surgeon, but it will most certainly include your primary care doctor. Should you need equipment or repairs to your prosthesis, you will need a prescription from your physician for these items or services. Therefore, it is important that you maintain regular follow-up with your primary care doctor or physiatrist so that they are aware of your needs. 
As you can see, rehabilitation following amputation is a process that can start either before or at the time of your surgery. Your relationship with the rehabilitation team members is one that will be long-standing. Take the opportunity to use these conditions as valuable resources, as each of them is there for you to use to help you reach your goals. An amputation is, in and of itself, a traumatic event for almost anyone. However, in many cases, an amputation can be the first step toward a more mobile and less painful life. Here is UCSF Medical Center orthopedic surgeon Richard Coughlin discussing the surgical side of treatment. We are, as experienced uh, clinicians and surgeons, well aware that uh, the best uh, possible result in most cases would be to salvage the limb that we do everything possible to maintain a good functioning limbs. Our goals, again, are the best possible result for a patient to return back to as normal functioning as possible. And sometimes that does require an amputation. Attempts at salvaging or saving limbs that aren't working well or that require patients to be in the hospital for months and months and are left with non-functioning uh, limbs is not doing anyone a favor. So in that regard, good counseling, letting patients know that uh, despite having given the best care possible, at times we do have to proceed to amputation surgery. But again, we look at this uh, procedure in this case as returning function to a patient and being the first step in reconstruction and the return to a more normal life. The consideration of, of where, to, where you can successfully achieve an amputation uh, level is uh, many times uh, complex. We certainly try to save as much of a limb as possible to maximize the amount of function uh, that a patient will have. But in many patients who have poor blood supply, it's not possible to do minor amputations, and sometimes we have to go uh, more proximal up the leg. Here at San Francisco General, we have an excellent, uh, outstanding vascular surgery service who can appropriately evaluate the patient, and there are procedures that can be done to increase blood flow to the leg to, so that we can salvage as much of a functioning leg as possible. We are always looking to create the best possible limb residual or remaining limb to accept the prosthesis and to get a patient to again return to as best of functioning status as possible. The first part of any uh, rehabilitation really is getting the wounds to heal correctly so that we're watching the wound healing and sutures generally in most places uh, remain in for at least three weeks to assure excellent uh, wound healing. Once the wounds are well healed, our prosthetist is then able to start to begin that process of getting the residual limb to lose its swelling, to return back to a more normal size, and in that case they can start to look at appropriate prosthetic fitting. As with any surgical procedure, pain management will play a significant role in an amputee's recovery. Here again is Dr. Pascal discussing the types of pain an amputee may typically experience and how best to treat them. There are two types of pain that a patient might experience after an amputation, residual limb pain and phantom limb pain. Residual limb pain affects the remaining part of the limb where the amputation took place. Pain may occur because there is a disruption of nerve endings during surgery. Because nerve disruption can occur in any type of major surgery, post-operative pain is quite common. Sometimes people develop pain due to abnormalities at these nerve endings. These abnormalities are called neuromas. If neuromas develop, your doctor may consider injection of medication into the area for relief. Residual limb pain may also be caused by inflammation or infection at the end of the residual limb, so it is important to monitor your skin carefully to prevent this from occurring. 
Sometimes discomfort in the residual limb can be a result of the edge of a bone creating pressure within the socket. Less often, some people might experience a bony type of growth at the end of the bone that results in discomfort in the socket. Your prosthetist can work with you to relieve these areas of discomfort. Residual limb pain is different from phantom limb pain or phantom limb sensation. Phantom limb sensation is when you feel a part of the limb that is no longer there. For example, if you've had an amputation to part of your leg, you might feel that your toe is still there. Phantom sensations are very common and are due to the brain thinking that the limb is still there. Therefore, one of the best ways to prevent and treat these phantom sensations is to constantly touch and massage the amputation area. If your incision site is still healing, you can work around that area just to give your brain feedback that there has been a change in where your limb ends. Because residual limb pain may be caused by infection, we closely monitor wound healing. The team will do this while you are in the hospital and they will educate you how to do the same before you are discharged from the hospital. You may also receive a limb guard during your hospital stay. Use of a limb guard or limb protector can prevent injury to your residual limb, such as bumping your limb against an object. It will really be important to attend your follow-up appointments with your doctor so that the incision site can continue to be closely monitored and so that your sutures or stitches can be removed in a timely fashion. Many patients may receive a compression stocking or stump shrinker to wear even before the incision site is healed. In these cases, it will be very important to continue to monitor your incision site for signs of infection or irritation and to keep your skin clean. Keeping your skin in excellent condition can prevent skin breakdown or clogging of skin follicles that could then result in pain and infection. Some patients may derive benefit from non-medication modalities such as acupuncture or nerve stimulator units for pain control. If needed, medications may be used for phantom limb pain. Depending on the type of pain that you may have, treatments may range from medications taken either by mouth or applied to the skin. Oral medications or medications by mouth that are commonly used in clothes that you might already be familiar with, including acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Interestingly, antidepressant and anti-seizure medications are frequently used for nerve pain, so your doctor may consider use of these medications for persistent pain. Commonly used medications include gabapentin, toperamate, pregabalin, venlafaxine, trazodone, just to name a few. The best way to prevent and address residual limb pain and phantom limb pain is to approach it from many different angles. That includes monitoring your incision site and skin for signs of infection, protecting your residual limb from injury with a limb protector, keeping your residual limb clean and dry, touching and massaging your residual limb frequently during the day, using your compression stockings regularly when your prosthetist says it's time to do so, and watching for signs of skin irritation with the use of your compression socking, socket liner, and socket. If you do experience residual limb pain or phantom limb sensation or pain, remember that you are not alone. With help and education from your treating team, you can learn to be in control.